start with some fun stories uh, of shit coins dying. We can never get enough of those. We got about 3,000 more of these shows to do. Uh, but we're going to start with our favorite, not our favorite, I'm sorry, our second favorite Mimble Wimble coin, uh, mm -hmm. which is Grin. And Grin is probably no more because as it turns out, no one was actually using it. I don't think anyone ever was using it. And here comes the death of yet another shit coin. All around me are my heavy shit coins. No more Bitcoin. No more Bitcoin. Uh, now, this is, of course, going to happen to every uh, Mimble Wimble token and all the privacy tokens and eventually Monero uh, because this is what happens when no one is using your shit coin. And um, I have a quick little graphic. Uh, this is, uh, I got to get like a, a more interesting version of this, but it goes something like this. Here's how Grin was created. I, I, I promise you this is exactly how Grin was created. Uh, oh my God, I've just coded the greatest privacy encryption protocol of all time, which is the, the Mimble Wimble protocol. And then someone replies, uh, but is it backwards compatible with Bitcoin? Can it be implemented with a soft fork? Unfortunately, in the case of Grin, uh, the answer was no, because if the answer was yes, uh, this privacy feature would have ended up in Bitcoin eventually. How did you get involved in the world of blockchain? Um, well, take me I mean, all the way back, Greg. Well, I started it all, but um... marketing, 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 and, uh, and and the thing about Grin was that that uh, that coin had some serious marketing. They were, I, I was hearing reports of uh, you know hedge funds that were. Uh, that were prepping themselves by uh, renting a lot of space, a uh, lot of CPU power on like Azure and AWS in order to mine Grin uh, initially as it came out because it had so much hype around it. And um, you know, th to be fair, there there are some exciting things about the tech that uh, that that would get people like hedge funds and VCs very excited. Um, and that, that, that's what happened was that there was a lot of hype at the beginning, but um, very, very, very quickly, it fell very, uh, the price fell very fast because it turns out not that many people were that interested in it. Right now we're hearing of a lot of people getting interested in Bitcoin. For example, like the boomer population, like there's a whole Bitcoin boomer um, movement that I think is emerging, which is really interesting. And I'm excited. There also the light, there's a lightning boomer side of things as well. Um, and I actually see usability. I mean, this is something I've talked about a lot in the past, but, you know, making the technology easier to use, enabling people to hold their own coins, you know, not your keys, not your coins. Um, but also building out more resilient infrastructure. Um, even in terms of the centralized institutions, you know, Things are going down, as we saw. Um, you know, it's still somewhat difficult to use. We want things to be more resilient. So, I think in terms of Lightning, you know, we knew for beta, it was command line only, right? And that was intentional, by the way. Then we saw the evolution of uh, wallets and, and user applications and UIs and use cases, and uh, I'm really excited about a lot of those that have emerged. But to me, I think the next four years will be about making this technology easier to use and you know there are design related elements to that other technical elements but then liquidity and for folks that have heard me speak in the past uh, around lightning they know that liquidity is something i'm really passionate about um, with lightning you've got amazing ske speed amazing scalability uh, very low fees but you do have this liquidity aspect to lightning you need inbound capacity in order to receive funds and of course you need funds outbound and channel in order to send um, so to me i see one of the challenges as ensuring that we have the proper liquidity. As one of our devs, uh, Yoast at Lightning Labs, like to say, um, the goal is to get the basic payment or you know basic transaction perfectly executed, right? Uh, yeah, so even, even if from privacy perspective, Lightning Network is way better than PayJoin, like regulated entity will still support it. Why? Because like, they can say, oh, it's not for privacy perspective. It's for uh, the utility of sending payment for cheap. So I think it's an important point, yes. And 
later on i don't know how it will go because it, it still maybe i still don't fully understand everything on this but when we will have a um, uh, Schnorr signature into Bitcoin and we can aggregate signature into one, uh, it might be even possible to, to make larger savings uh, around this. So it, it, will, it will be interesting. Louis is the inventor of the datagram, a precursor of the TCP IP protocol. And he's the designer of an early packet switching network called CCLAD. In the 1960s, Louis created the ancestor of the command line interface, and he coined the term shell. Currently, Louis is the director of projects at Eurolink, a lobbying organization working for multilingualism and better internet governance. Louis is also the president of Savoir Faire, which manages top-level domains for OpenRoot, an alternative DNS service challenging ICANN. Yeah, I mean, one other fear that was like came with the second halving in 2016, they kind of go hand in hand uh, with the mining death spiral fear was the this kind of power concentration, like, oh my God, like one of one company gets access to almost all the mining. And, you know, to some extent that became true, like Bitmain really, you know, of course there were many, several mining pools, but Bitmain was providing all the chips to everyone. So they had this unprecedented power in the market. Mm -hmm. And that of course makes people fearful about a 51% attack and things like that. Um, so, but yeah, for today, I don't see any of those concerns. You have to have a system which is flexible enough so that each one can use it with a minimum effort without making complications. I really like rack my brain around how do I recommend people store this stuff? Like I didn't, I couldn't recommend any of the exchanges. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I remember writing this manual even of like, uh, no, actually I recorded a, a tutorial video on, you know, you go to uh, paperwallet.com and then you go offline and then you run the program in your browser and then it'll generate a, a it was a clear text private key. How, you know, buy Bitcoin, first of all, why? Um, and second of all, how? Has the Fed done all it can do? Well, there's a lot more we can do. We're not out of ammunition by a long shot. No, there's, there's really no limit to what we can do with these lending programs that we have. Yeah, the why, the why to me was like the first skepticism that I had was exactly about the scarcity. And then once I was convinced that it was actually scarce, that became the biggest selling point. It's like, oh, so this is digital gold. And then it's mm -hmm. like a no-brainer. Like if it really is digital gold, and, and like in, in 2010, Satoshi on, on the forums, he, he actually described Bitcoin as like, you know, imagine, imagine a gray metal that has like no, no um, application whatsoever, except you can send it over the internet. You can send it digitally on a wire and like what kind of price would that metal have? And like, that's literally, he's describing digital gold. A lot of people think internet will be the same forever. Not realistic. They haven't thought yet that they don't have to adjust to a new era of internet. We will have a, a period of time to adjust to the limits of what can be done with computers and what should not be done by computers. <laughs> <laughs>